Um, in high conflict co-parenting, there's also seasons of that. It might not look like ongoing forever. It might just be a short season because you're trying to make a decision. Ooh, I need to be coming from the heart, coming from the heart. Welcome back to Mom Nation from the Heart. And now a word from our sponsor. Hello everyone, this is Ryan Gilliam, Senior Mortgage Banker with Waterstone Mortgage. If you're looking to buy a new home or even refinance a current one, I'm able to help you find the best program and interest rate that fits your specific needs. You could call me anytime directly at phone number 480-635-3035 if you have any mortgage questions or if you're ready to get pre-approved for a new home purchase. Thank you. Hey, Mom Nation, we are back with another episode of From the Heart, where we share inspirational stories, useful information, and we discuss a variety of women-related topics. Please give us a like and follow where you're at right now on your favorite platform, whether you're watching this video or you are on a podcast platform. We would really appreciate a like, a follow, a subscribe, because that really helps us get this information out to the people who need to hear it. I am Katie, the founder of Mom Nation, and I would like to welcome our beautiful co-host, Miss Sherry, our co-founder. Founder. How's it going, Cher? Excellent. How are you? Doing good after the holiday weekend. You resting up? Oh, yes. We we hit it hard. We went kayaking. We went hiking. We did all of the things. And so my 37-year-old body is telling me, whoa, you did way too much. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah, you That's go to work just to re- recover from your weekend. Right. It's no longer recovering from hangovers. It's recovering from the outdoor adventures we had. <laughs> awesome. I would like to also welcome Mandy Johnson, who has been in our Mom Nation group. If you guys don't know, we have a group on Facebook. She has been in our group for, we were trying to figure it out, Cher, um, before you hopped on. I think forever. I think she's been in there forever. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure I have been. <laughs> Welcome, Mandy. So excited to have you join us today. And your topic is something that we have we have talked about before, not quite like this. Um, so I'm really, really excited to dig into this with you. But Cherry and I have had these experiences, and we've talked about them a bit. Um, so this is like right up our alley. I'm so, so looking forward to uncovering the um, the advice that you have really, um, because I know that that's so helpful for our mamas out there. There are so many people out there that are dealing with co-parenting situations. So many people, like so many more now, I feel like than when I was growing up in the eighties and I was the weird kid that had divorced parents. Now, mind you, many of my friends' parents probably should have been divorced also, right? (laughs) Um, but I was the weird kid that was going through it seemingly all by myself. And that had impact on me, truly did. Um, so today we're talking with Mandy Johnson about uh, high conflict co-parenting. Can you tell us just a little bit about you? Where does your insight come from? Why did you choose this topic to be on with us today? Yes, absolutely. I am honored to be here. And I am not an expert in this area, but I have so much experience because I've been married to my husband, my amazing husband for almost five years now, and we have four kids and do life blended. So I am a blended family and stepmom advocate, and we share our two oldest kids. Um, I share my daughter and he shares his son. And then we have two little boys that we have together. Wow. So you've got some different dynamic in there. And now the little kids, the little ones that you both share, what is their perception of their older brother, brothers and sisters situation? Like, is this something, are they old enough to know? Is this something, because I get that, I see that question or I see people struggle with that. Hey, you know, my first kid is, is with another marriage or, you know, from another marriage or whatever, like, how do I go about making us feel like a cohesive family with the new siblings, even though there is a co-parenting situation. Does that make sense? Or did I totally convolute that? (laughs) No, that totally makes sense. And, um, a lot of people that I work with, sometimes they might be hesitant to bring another child into the scenario or into the family because 
the co-parenting dynamic is high conflict. It does get crazy and it makes things difficult. Um, my husband and I knew right away that we wanted more kids and that we were game for anything that was thrown our way. And our boys that we share are three and one. So they are still very little, but this is all that they've known. They've, they know that they share their big kids. And, um, I think it goes in seasons, you know, with our three-year-old, especially since he was the first, um, there were times where it was really hard for him to say goodbye when exchanges are in person and you have to do that physical goodbye and you're watching them leave. There were times where that was really hard for him. And it was kind of heartbreaking seeing him cry at the door and wave, no sis, no sis. And, um, you know, it took a lot to work through that, but with our youngest, we haven't had that problem or we didn't face that because I think he had the older example of our three-year-old being like, bye, I love you. See you at pickup, you know, and the schedule is more consistent now. So he knows, Oh, today is, you know, Tuesday or Wednesday or Friday. He has, since he's older and he's lived the schedule longer, he can kind of anticipate when they're coming back. Whereas before, when he was a lot younger, he didn't know how to categorize that in his brain. So he's like, I'm never going to see her again. This is the first day ever. Oh, so he panicked. Yeah. Um, and even to this day, they are still like best friends (laughs) and I love that so much. But yeah, it just took a little bit of growing things you don't expect when you become a blend of family. Yes. And then those little kids also always hit you in the gut, right? Like they say little things that are like, you know, I'm going to miss you at drop off or things that maybe we didn't expect or anticipate. And it just, oh, it gets you. My, um, my oldest and then my second are about three and a half years apart. And so drop off was not something that we did from like when she was born. It was something that was introduced years later. So it was foreign to them, both of them. Um, and something that she would say is like, well, are they my siblings too? Cause she has other siblings and she just felt left out. And I was just like, what do I do? You know, like I had no idea, but thankfully my oldest, her dad was like, yeah, she just like jumped in was like, yeah, you're their sibling too. So Oh, that's a sweet way of taking care of it. Of just like being inclusive. That's so nice. Yeah. Um, I was like, you're in the headlights. I didn't know what to do. So thankfully like he, he, he did, moved in, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what do you like? I was looking, sorry. I was looking up while you were talking, I was looking up the current divorce rates. So current meaning 2021, um, is 45%. And then I was trying to do some digging of what percentage of families in America are blended because I know it's huge. Mm-hmm. Um, just cause I think it would be interesting since we're talking about this topic, but, um, what do you think designates this as high conflict? So what are those high conflict things that you guys have to deal with? Good question. Yeah, no, that's great. And, you know, for high conflict co-parenting, it only takes one co-parent to make it high conflict. Are there scenarios where both co-parents are high conflict? Absolutely. Have, are, I'm not perfect. So are there scenarios where I've been high conflict? Yes. Um, in high conflict co-parenting, there's also seasons of that. It might not look like ongoing forever. It might just be a short season because you're trying to make a decision or, you know, there's, uh, something that has been added to the dynamic that you weren't expecting. And so sometimes those seasons are short, but sometimes the season of high conflict co-parenting is actually a lifetime. And, you know, to determine if the co-parenting relationship is high conflict or not, I see three common factors and those three ingredients to make the recipe for high conflict co-parenting are no flexibility, impossible communication and manipulation. And you know, if there's no flexibility in the court order, 
it makes things really difficult. And the court order is put in place to protect the child and to protect each parent to make sure that that parenting time is guarded. And some of those parenting time orders are super black and white and very specific, and some are generic. And so there's a lot of gray area and a lot of things to (laughs) work out. Mm -hmm. And when two parents are able to have you know, a healthy co-parenting relationship, they can generally make decisions in regards to holidays and exchanges and parenting time that is in the best interest of the child, even if it's not addressed in the quarter. You know, for example, for the longest time, there was no vacation time addressed in one of our court orders. And we were able to be flexible because I could see the value of my child going on vacation and spending additional time with that parent and family. And so we were able to reach an agreement to do that. There are scenarios where flexibility is impossible because the court order is truly protecting the child and the parent from, you know, abuse and harm. And so should there be flexibility in that? No, but when the parenting, when the court order is used as a weapon and it's rigid and there's no flexibility. That is what just stirs the pot for that high co-parenting and all of that conflict. You know, for example, when a court, a judge puts a court order in place, how are they going to be able to see holidays, you know, 10 years down the road, how are they going to know where those holidays fall on the calendar and, you know, see what exchanges look like. I can look at the court order in the calendar and be like, oh, four exchanges, four days in a row, two weeks in a row, that is going to be a complete hot mess and just leave everyone feeling chaotic. And so should there be flexibility so that child doesn't have to experience the back and forth so much? Yeah. Two co-parents in a healthy co-parenting relationship should be able to reach an agreement. Someone should have to make the sacrifice and it shouldn't be the child. It should be one of the co-parents to make sure that that child is set up for exam, set up for success. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense and makes a lot of sense to me coming from that scenario. So my parents were divorced when I was two. I don't even remember them being together. There were court orders and all sorts of stuff that I didn't understand as such a young child. And I don't know if they were followed or if they were there was flexibility between the two or how my parents handled it. I honestly don't know, but I do remember feeling very, um, just never being able to settle down and never feeling settled. Like, well, how long am I going to be here? I don't know, you know, and there is a different lengths of time I remember. And I, so I can totally relate with what you're saying. Like, it's got to be what's best for the kid, so the kid doesn't end up suffering. And yeah, I mean, the judge does how many of these a day? Like, yeah. I don't know, you know, like so many, and they just see it. All, I mean, that's their job. They see it all day, every day. And when, you know, families are in the courtroom, they're only just giving a small snapshot of what, you know, usually they want. And so it's hard. I can't imagine being a judge and looking in and being like, well, this is my recommendation. Well, and I get that their job, they have to write it down. It has to be on paper, but what is reflected on paper? Well, like we're not robots. Our kids aren't robots. We're not robots. So what works and looks good on paper doesn't mean it actually works in real life. Um, and like you said, I mean, think about the dynamic, maybe rotating and, and alternating in this way worked until you had more kids. I mean, there's so many factors that come into play. Um, something, so I really love the three things that you talked about, like no fa- flexibility, manipulation. And then what was the third one? Communication. Um, communication. Yes. Impossible okay. communication. Yep. Yes. So I have a question. Do you feel that all of those stem from an emotional aspect like it doesn't matter what emotion but like anger hurt sad it whatever do you feel that the inability for flexibility the manipulation the impossible communication do all of those things stem from some kind of an emotion yeah and I am a trauma integration practitioner and I became one because I wanted resources for my kids and I realized as I 
research trauma that, whoa, I have experienced a lot of trauma that I didn't realize even within my blended family, because, you know, of this high conflict and stress scenario and with manipulation, you know, that does come from pain, hurt, anger, even fear. And there's a difference between, you know, there's a short lived season for that manipulation. You know, when I first (laughs) went through my divorce, I was a people pleaser and I wanted to avoid conflict at all costs. I carried a lot of guilt and shame from the divorce. And so when there was a disagreement, like, was I easily manipulated? Yeah. Did I give in? Yeah. But and that's because I didn't have very good boundaries, but also like, did we know how to poke each other and like, try to get a reaction and try to get what we want? Yeah. And the, there's going to be learning and mistakes in that area as you learn, but there's a different kind of man- manipulation that people endure in high co- conflict co-parenting that lasts longer than a season. And that's abusive. It's co-parenting abuse. And that, you know, a co-parent trying to control the person or a scenario to get a specific response, to get a specific behavior, to get a specific outcome. That's the kind of manipulation that I'm talking about that, you know, it's more than just a person trying to get what they want every once in a while, or, you know, they've hit a rough patch in life. And so their go-to is just to, you know, try to get what they want when a disagreement happens, like this is, it's deeper. And yeah, I think it comes from like a hurt or a pain or anger, or, you know, a lot of times even childhood trauma. And that's where that reaction has now become a pattern and a normal for them. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Can you give, well, let's stick on manipulation real quick. And then I have another question about one of the other ones. Um, But that could also start trickling down to the kids too, right? Like, hey, XYZ parent did this in our relationship or XYZ parent is this, or like, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like shit talk, shit talk Mm -hmm. is a really good way of uh, describing it. Would you say that that, has a sort of falls into that category. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, there's a difference when, you know, something happens and it's just frustrating. And so they're just letting off steam and another where, you know, they're saying things to try to turn the child against another co-parent or control the relationship. Like there's a very, those are very different scenarios. And it goes down a dark path. It's hard. I always referred to that as using the kids as pawns. So like my ex husband, even when we were still married, started down that, like once I was like, "Eh, I want a divorce, um, would do the like mommy's breaking up the family type thing. Right. And then it was, it just went downhill. So Yeah. I, I think of that as they're using them as pawns, but that broke me. So like, I didn't want that happening. So that kept me for the longest time, because like you said, it's manipulation and I didn't want my kids to be going through that or hearing that. Is that something that you still see? Like, I can't imagine sending my kid off and then they're hearing that for a week and then coming home. And then I have to break that, you know, like, I can't imagine, is that something that you've experienced? Yeah, that's something that I've experienced, whether it's intentional or unintentional, it happened. And unfortunately, the child is the one who, even though it breaks us and it's like, oh, this hurts so much. It's also hurting the child so much because at the end of the day, that child feels like they're half of you and they're half of them. And so when they're hearing somebody put down the other parent, that's half of them and they carry that burden. And then sometimes they stay quiet because it's a lot to process. Like I'm an adult and sometimes it's a lot to process when I hear someone, you know, bashing me or accusing me of things or spreading lies. I'm like, what? No. And, you know, these are little tiny humans that don't know how to put their words and emotion, their emotions into words. They don't know how to describe how they're feeling necessary. And so they carry that 
with them. And that is such a heavy, that is such a heavy burden. And so a lot of the times, um, one of the tools that I use is, is, well, how does that make you feel? Because it would be really easy to get triggered and be like, they said, what? Tell me what they said. Who are they talking to? You know, and just like go off the deep end, which is probably what they want. But then, you know, you're just putting that child in the middle too. So you're in the wrong as well. So I've tried to use the tool, like, how does that make you feel? Well, how does that make your heart feel? Like, is this something that you want to talk about? Are you telling me because you needed to get it off your chest? Do you want to talk to somebody else about it? That way they can, they don't have to carry it anymore. That's good advice because I mean, you know, I, I feel like, like the, the biggest, most basic thing that any child needs to feel is, is safe. Right. And so if I start hearing, you know, the parent that I'm about to go spend some time with is less than what they should be to care for a child, all of a sudden now I'm not feeling safe. Right. Now I'm starting to question that person but wait a minute, I feel like it gets worse because I'm, I'm young and I'm not able to process things and I don't understand and I don't understand relationships and I don't understand feelings and I don't understand why things are the way they are. Am I now being deprived of the opportunity to feel as close to either parent as I could have without that chatter in my ear, changing my direction, changing my feelings, changing my mind? Like it's giant. Katie, you've mentioned something in the past too that like a, for me now thinking about it, it's a basic human need, right? A human right is being heard. And when you're that little kid, if you're hearing negative talk about whoever, now you're not going to want to share the the good things that happen with the other parent. You're not, so you're, you're being denied just even the ability to be heard on any level, whether it's positive or negative. Um, you're not going to want to share those things. So, yeah. Yeah. And internal when, conflict. yes, internal conflict. And then even when something good happens with that parent, you question it. Yep. And that affects your security too. I know this because I'm, I can see how it's panned out in like my relationship as I'm going to now an adult because my, I, my parents were divorced when I was young and it's, it's hard. It is. It's very hard. Um, very hard on the kids. And like what you said in the beginning of the show, the worst thing that we can do is let our kids take the brunt of it. And the unfortunate thing is our kids mostly take the brunt of it. You know, oh. I shouldered a lot of that. I still do. I'm 43 years old. I still shoulder a lot of that, you know, just because yeah. it's just so deep. Yeah, I do too. I'm like, if I can just keep everything perfect and make everyone happy, then there will be no conflict. There will be no fighting and everything will be perfect. It'll be fine. And I didn't realize that my perfectionism was a trauma response and that I used it to keep me safe and to protect me from hurt. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of years of figuring out the patterns of where it started. And it started when I was really little Mm -hmm. and it mostly often does, Mm -hmm. you know, I have a lot of friends that are counselors, um, been in therapy myself, um, just in talking with a a lot of people that I talk to, it pretty much always is dialed back to childhood. Um, and even little, little, you know, so something for us as parents, which is why I'm so glad that we take the time to have these really hard conversations in such a public forum is because I know that there are people out there that need to hear it and they can do their best to hopefully prevent some of those deep wounds from happening in, you know, inside of their own families. And that, that is really my wish for, for this. Um, Let's talk about communication. So the three things that you brought up um, in determining, you know, a high conflict co-parenting relationship was the no flexibility, impossible communication and manipulation. Can you give some examples about what impossible communication looks like? Yeah. So there's a difference between impossible communication and just ineffective communication. You know, when 
you, you just don't understand what the person is saying, or you're interpreting it one way because of your perspective and your life experiences, you know, that's different versus someone just doesn't want to be understood. They just don't want to understand. They just, it's their way or the highway. And, you know, do you, do you dread getting a text or a call from that person? Do you avoid your email? Do you like get anxious or have certain feelings when you're about to do an in-person exchange? Like, do you just cringe? Um, does it feel like you're talking in circles or to a brick wall? You know, it's that kind of communication is exhausting and a healthy co-parenting relationship. They can be communicating and working together to tackle obstacles to set the child up for success. Will there be disagreements? Yes. Um, but with impossible communication, you need to set a lot more boundaries in place to protect yourself and your time and your peace in your heart. Otherwise, it's just going to go on forever. You know, there are platforms that can help set communication up for success. You know, there are court approved ones. So our family wizard is a common one. Talking parents is another. And my favorite is called the family core. And that takes the communication away from texting, away from the phone calls, away from the email so that you can separate your personal life from the co-parenting because, you know, I went from a marriage, which started as a friendship and then moved into, you know, a marriage that's supposed to be like trusting and intimate and deep from then the divorce to now a co-parenting, which is a business relationship. And so when you're available for texting 24 seven and someone who is, is an impossible communicator is blowing up your phone at whenever they want, like that's just bad news in so many ways. And so removing that opportunity and putting it in an app where you can, you know, set business hours. I'm only checking it between this time and this time when you get a message and it sends you down a dark road or it triggers you into anxiety, or maybe you just need some outside perspective. You can say, you know what, I'm going to set a timer. I'm not going to respond to that right away. Like I don't, this is not an emergency. I don't need to respond to that right away. I can cool down or I can ask for help or I can just wait. Like just sometimes time and waiting and some deep breaths <laughs> solves a lot of problems and avoids a lot of conflict. And the impossible communication, it might not go on forever. Like I said, there just might be seasons, but in that high conflict co-parenting, it is, it could be a lifetime. And so setting yourself up for success and protecting yourself and moving to a platform where you don't have to get notifications, you know, you don't have to check every single hour is really going to lift so many burdens. I love that you said that. I love that you said, Hey, there's apps out there, get these apps. Cause it separates it from, I mean, who's not basically sitting on their phone all day, every day. You know what I mean? Like you're going to see the text come through and there's times when you, I mean, just in my own life, when I may be triggered by something that comes through and there's times when I may not be just kind of depending on it. Has it been a stressful day? Um, you know, all of those different ingredients. So I love that you said that. Do you, so, so, so I'm leaning toward your suggestion is probably to keep most communication in writing. Yeah. Versus, okay. Yeah. Um, even when our co-parenting relationships are great, it's just easiest to keep it, you know, in writing, in text or in email that way, you know, there's more trust that is able to be built because no one can really be sneaky when you're texting or you're messaging. And so there's a level of protection for each parent that where trust can be built because, you know, if you just came out of a high conflict season and you're trying to gain momentum to have healthy co-parenting again, you know, you need to set up opportunities to build trust and to build security and to create that safe space and texting you, like you said, you know, you're on your phone so much, all it takes is to receive a text at the wrong time. You know, maybe you're hangry. Maybe your boss just gave you feedback. Maybe one of your kids just like fell and smashed their face and you receive a text and it can just, you can, depending on how you're feeling, you can either respond great or not. Yeah. And so, yeah, taking it off is, 
I, I highly encourage that. Are you able to text sometimes? Yeah. We text, Hey, can, you know, this child FaceTime you right now? Should you text then instead of email? Yeah. Because you don't want to miss that opportunity. Right. Right. Should you probably, yeah. Sherry, how do you handle yours? Um, so thankfully for me, um, one thing that I do want to point out is you mentioned there could be seasons. And so I've gone through really, really rough seasons, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, you know, not everything has to be 18 years of high conflict. So thankfully for me, I'm not in a high conflict situation currently. Um, I have really great relationships or at least you can figure it out, right? Like it Mm -hmm. might, there might be a tax or something like you said, Mandy, but for the most part, we, we communicate well. And, um, so we do, I don't do an app. However, it's something that we've looked at. Um, I, my, um, daughter's stepmom, her and I, there's, there's been moments like when we were in it and we were both emotionally tied to things, like we didn't like each other. Now she's one of my really close friends and I love her. Um, and I consider her a sister and people sometimes are like, that's crazy, but I love her. And so her and I do all of the communication and we don't even need that. You know what I mean? Like not in a bad way, but we don't even need like her and I just plan everything together. Um, but if I needed to go to my daughter's dad, I could, and you know, there's no issues there. Um, so that just, just so people know, like, I want you mama, if you are going through it right now and it's a high conflict, like doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be like that forever. Um, and And then with my other co-parent, um, you know, are there days that we're having a conversation or my, my child's FaceTiming that parent and the parent wants to talk to me about something and it maybe I'll end the conversation. I'm like, Hey, this conversation's over. And then we could text about it later. And that has done wonders. You know, there's no fighting. There's no bickering. There's no nothing. I just, Hey, we're going to end this conversation right now because the FaceTiming is for you and the child, not for me and you. Um, but so I love the apps. I think that's a great idea, especially because I've heard a lot of people like that can help you in court if you need, um, or there's even apps now that show and track the child support. Um, so like, did they pay, did they not pay? So a parent can't say I already paid you. And then, you know, you're stuck in the middle of that. So I think that's a great thing to talk about it and make sure moms know that there's so many resources out there because there's such a high prevalence of blended families today. It's way different than it was back in the day when we were kids. Yeah, yeah. no, so different. And what I love about, um, the family core app is you, it's not like black and white, like this is only for communication. It's like happy. And when the child is older and has their own phone, you can invite that child into it and only share certain things that way. The best example I can give is, you know, the child has a field trip coming up. And so a permission slip needs to be signed. Well, maybe you got the permission slip, but now you can't send it in and the other parent has to do it. So you can set it up as a task and that child can see that the task is addressed and that they can have security. Like, okay, this is going to be taken care of. I don't have to talk to either of my parents about who's going to sign the permission slip. If I can go, who's sending the five bucks or whatever, because it's there and they can see it. And another cool thing about that is, um, you can set up GPS. So let's say your child is with the other parent, and the parent was like, oh yeah, we're going, I'm, I said, they, they could go to the movies with their friends you know, the child can like check in when they get to the movies and both parents can see that. And like, that is so one, it teaches the child responsibility. Like, Hey, you can't work over one parent and not the other. And like be sneaky, like you have to be responsible and check in. And it allows for both parents to be a part of that and have that security of being like, okay, my child got their safe they're with friends. And now I know when they leave. And so I really, really like that app. It's like friendly, happy, and it promotes so much more than just communication. I love that. Agreed. Um, and I love what Sherry brought up about befriending the new partner of the old spouse. Um, something that I never experienced growing up, it was you know, they were at war. They had to hate each other for whatever reason. I don't know whose problem that was. I don't know why. 
But it's like, look, the relationship's not obviously working and you're not together. So why can't they be with somebody else that makes them happy and has impact on the child? So like these step parents that I had had a lot of impact on me. Wouldn't you, as my mother or my father, want to be a part of that or know what's going on or encourage that? Like, that's so huge, Sherry, that you do that. And and I'm sure it's helped you in just more ways than what you just described. Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, if you're sending your kids somewhere, I mean, I know who's taking care of my kid. And it's not to say anything bad about her dad. He just works a lot. Mm -hmm. So, like, I know that he's not there primarily. Right. So why wouldn't I want to have a relationship? Why wouldn't I want to know what type of parent she is to know her, to know how I parent to maybe set those boundaries, you know, like there's, I think I've seen in our group, like posts about, and this, this one's coming back from a long time ago, but somebody said, Hey, my kid was with their, their other parent and the stepmom shaved her legs. Like that's some, I was like, what, No, what? you know, but that yeah. some of those things are unwritten rules. Like you can't have expectations and not share them with the other person. So if you're not communicating and you hate them, that person might not know that that's crossing a line for you. Or, you know, one of my friends uh, does haircuts with her son and now the new boyfriend's doing haircuts and like, that's hard. But if we're not communicating and we're not attempting to have some sort of a relationship with them. We can't, you know, it just gets into that emotional side where maybe they're trying to, to trigger you or you're trying to trigger them. And it's just like, we need to always put the kids first, whether it it hurts us or not. We're the adults. We need to make sure, Hey, is my kid having fun? Does my kid love going there? Great. How can I make it better? Yeah. And create less conflict versus more. Because now right. we're not only mad at the other spouse, but we're mad at the spouse's partner too. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> so my um, daughter's dad and I, we were co-parenting just us for a long time before, well, not a long time, but f- for longer before I met my husband. And we had this like unwritten rule that when we were ready to introduce a significant other to our daughter, that the other co-parent would need to meet first, or at least have the opportunity to meet, which is like wild. And it was like super uncomfortable to be like, Hey, like, I think that this is a good idea. We could kind of make it work. Like this is really awkward. Um, but one, it eliminated so much animosity and it showed like, Hey, I still value you. I still trust you. Like I still care about your input in regards to big decisions for our child. And, you know, we used to be married. And so he knows how to annoy me. He knows how to get a reaction for me, but he can also see like who I am as a person. And so I was kind of trusting that like, if he met someone and they had a conversation, like, I'm not saying that if he was like, no, that dude, I don't like that dude, you know, it wouldn't be an end all, but I would still trust. I would still take into consideration what he said. If it was like, uh, I don't, you know, like this, this, like rub me the wrong way or give me bad vibes or, you know, just like be careful, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that worked for us. And so he met my husband and, um, I, his, my daughter's stepmom, I don't know if she considers herself stepmom. I do. Cause I really like her and they've been together for a while. Um, but he offered that to me too, but the season of life we were in, it was like so crazy and busy. It looked different. And, I re- I just trusted his judgment because he waited a while before introducing them mm-hmm. probably because of, you know, the, what he experienced with me and my husband, but that was, it's not going to work for everybody, but it worked for us. Yeah. yeah. Or even the part that I really like, um, is that like, so my daughter's dad and his wife, like I'm really close with the wife, the stepmom. Um, you know, we were able to have family functions where my, um, youngest daughter's parent, like we would all be around each other and interacting and that's how it should be. If it's in the best interest of the kids, like we did Christmas all together, you know, and it shouldn't be like an issue. So my daughter's dad and my, um, my wife at the time, like they got along, they were great, you know, and interacted and, 
all the family. So, I mean, if that's all it takes is to be an adult with open communication and just maybe being a little more open-minded and not having animosity, it didn't work out. It didn't work out. So why are we like, so hell bent on you can't be with anybody else or, you know, no, that's not life. It's really not. And wouldn't, okay. Don't we want them to be happy so that they like, aren't shitty to us? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, yes, please go out and find that person that makes you happy so that I can deal with happy person when I have to communicate with you versus somebody who's lacking things in their life. It just makes so much sense to me that we would want to encourage that. Um, I know we have so much more to talk about. We don't have much longer though, Mandy. Um, what I did want to touch on is obviously this brings stress into your home. Mm. So can you sort of, um, describe a little bit about what that looks like? Because like you said earlier, when you said, Hey, I went through trauma and I didn't even know it. A lot of people that happens to a lot of people, but they could be in conflict or they could be in stress in their home because of the conflict and they don't even know it. Yeah. I mean, I didn't know it. I thought, oh, like I just need to adapt better. I just need to keep being perfect and show these, you know, show the other co-parent that like, I'm doing my best and like, I really do add value and like, I'm happy. And, but the thing is, is like, I'm not perfect. And there were times that like, I needed to own my part. Like I specifically, I was pregnant and it was during COVID and a a co-parent texted me and I knew, you know, you know, these co-parents, so, you know, when they're irritated, but I was like, game on boxing gloves, ready to go. I like showed up to that fight and I didn't need to. And so, uh, I had to own that I had to own that and be like, I wasn't my best self. Like, I am really sorry. I do think we can reach an agreement. Like let's work together. Um, and so that has helped is knowing when I'm not being my best self setting boundaries, you know, no, is a complete sentence. Like I just said, just because someone shows up to fight doesn't mean that you need to show up to that fight. Right. Um, you know, trauma work has done wonders for me because I didn't realize I just reached a point where I was like, this is not who I want to be, but I can't understand. I don't understand why I'm reacting this way or why I'm responding this way. Or like why I feel irritated right now. Like, am I supposed to feel irritated right now? And the thing about trauma is it's a shock to the body and the mind, and it takes up space and it creates a new belief. And when it happens over and over, then you know, that response gets automated and it just happens so fast. You know, trauma doesn't come back as a memory. It comes back as a reaction, a reaction. Exactly. And so I had to figure that out. And I'm so glad that I got curious about my kids because it made me get curious about myself. And, you know, we are so resilient and healing from this and adding tools to your tool belt so that you can set yourself up for success and your kids and your marriage is incredible. And it helps navigate that stress in a different way, because what I love to be like, yes, you know what? High conflict co-parenting doesn't bring stress into my home. It doesn't bring stress into my marriage or my relationship with my kids, but that would be a lie because I'm not a robot. I am human. I have all of these experiences that I have to work through and, you know, setting boundaries, working through those unresolved experiences to accept them for what they were and what happened to you and knowing how to protect yourself in a healthy way in the future, your, you know, protect your relationships and your marriage and, you know, giving yourself what you need is so helpful. And so there are some things that besides those, you know, for my marriage, you know, we separate date night and then we have like a sync night and the sync night is when we talk about the co-parenting stuff and we make the decisions and we talk about the court stuff and we go over the budget and all that stuff. And then we go on a date. Like I would never bring my co-parents on a date with us to be like third wheel and eat steak and wine. So like, why do I want to talk about them during that? No, I don't. I want to enjoy my husband and like, be in love and like live out my fairy tale. So we separate the sync night where we do like all annoying stuff when I get, and then I'm annoyed and then I can be happy on my date night. And so 
you know, that, I mean, that comes with boundaries too. That Mm -hmm. is, I never thought of that. That is such a great thing to keep in mind that, and what I, what I gathered from what you just said is when it's date night time, when it's time to connect with your spouse, basically don't bring up things that you wouldn't invite to that date night. No. Brilliant. Like like, parenting or not, that's brilliant for all aspects of relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Or like in, when you're sitting down about to watch a show, like don't bring that up. Like we're in the bedroom. Don't bring it up. You know, like there has to be safe places in your entire life where you're not bombarded with all of this stuff. I think people have a hard time sectioning that out though, especially if they're not aware necessarily that they're dealing with high stress, high conflict, or they're dealing with things they don't necessarily need to. Um, Mm -hmm. I think it's really hard for people to do that because when things are happening and you have an emotional reaction about it and it's happening now, it's really hard to put it down for another time. Yeah. And you know, when you're dysregulated, you just want to get to some sort of closure and calm and process it. So sometimes you're like, I just need to talk about it and get it off my chest, but then that's not helpful because you're, yep. You're still feeling the same way. Mm -hmm. Um, and so having those tools to under and just the awareness, like, okay, I'm feeling this way, but I'm safe. I'm safe. I am loved. I am in a healthy relationship. I can set this down and not pick it up for a while, but being aware, it's so hard to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Any, I know, and I know we need to have you come back. We need a part two, because I'm going to ask you this question and you're going to be like, yeah, a ton. Um, But is there anything that we haven't said that you haven't been able to say that you really wanted to say today? You know, just one last thing is I used to live life isolated in my blended family for a couple of years because one, I was living out of fear. You know, I was scared. One of our kids would be taken from us. You know, there were tracking devices used and, you know, that security was broken and wondering where is my safe place? Who can I trust? Where are my friendships? You know, I live life isolated because I had never experienced stuff like this before. And it was such a dark season for me. And I don't want anyone to feel that way. And that's why I think it's important to use a voice and to share these resources because like, we are not meant to do life alone. Mom nation is one of the most incredible platforms and groups out there because it truly provides a safe place for moms to come and ask questions and get support and feedback. And there's no gossip and trash talking and all the things. There are incredible resources in that group. And I feel honored and blessed to be able to share and add value to that. And if you're, if you're listening and you're feeling, you can identify with some of these, take action and reach out for help ask for help, search any of the resources that I included, look at the show notes because you're not meant to stay in that isolated spot. You're meant to have community. Mom nation is an incredible, incredible community and co-parenting is hard. You do not need to do it alone. Totally agree. And thank you so much. We, we love having you as a member and it just, I mean, Sherry and I, it's, it's our, our passion to, encourage and bring together and support women. And I mean, nothing makes us happier than that. So thank you for saying that. And we're so glad to have had you here and we hope we get to have you on again, Mandy, because this was an amazing talk and something that really hits home for both Cher and I. Yeah. I would love to chat. Yeah. Thank you guys. Awesome. You're welcome. All right, everybody out there, if you are interested in being a guest on the show, just like Mandy was today, please follow us at Mom Nation USA. That is our handle. We are on Facebook, YouTube. We are on Instagram. Shoot us a quick message. Let us know why you'd like to be on the show. And while you are there, please download, subscribe, rate us. That way we can organically grow to the ears that need to hear this stuff because we know, right, ladies, there are a lot of ears that need to hear this stuff. Yes. Yeah, 45% last year divorce rate. See lots of years there. All right, ladies. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.